Hey folks, this is Brandon Noto from EMSBasics.com and we're going to talk about STEMIs. So this is one for all the medics out there. STEMIs we know are a big deal because high mortality, high morbidity in the people who do survive them and maybe more than a lot of equally deadly diseases, they're really the kind of thing that we can help. Uh, someone has a stroke maybe, yeah you can do your thing, get them into the hospital quickly, maybe they get TPA, but it doesn't help all that much, it's not that great. But these STEMI patients, with the reperfusion techniques we have now, we can really help them a lot. But to do it, you got to get them in there quickly, and that means diagnosing it in the field, maybe calling ahead and activating the cath lab, going to the right place. So it's really the chance for us to shine in EMS and really have a, a positive effect on the patient's outcome. So it's a big deal, and we rightly make a, a big deal about finding ST elevation on an EKG. However, it's not that easy. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And the problem that it comes down to is most of the time when you see ST elevation, it's not caused by an MI. And I say that again. Most of the time, ST elevation is not an MI. And you may or may not believe that. We're going to talk about it more. But then the other half of the problem is we really can't tell when it is and when it isn't. This is a quote by Brady, William Brady, a very good uh, emergency physician who does a lot of work in this field. Unfortunately, ST elevation is not an uncommon finding on the EKG of a chest pain patient, but its cause infrequently involves AMI. All right, how common is it actually? This is a study, again, by Brady, but there are a number of studies showing a s similar data. What they did was they took a, a fairly busy emergency department, they did a review of charts from a three month period. They looked at all the adults who came in with a complaint of chest pain, ended up with about 900 of them. And they looked for really a pretty good criteria for ST elevation. They looked for over a millimeter of elevation in limb leads, over two millimeters in the precordial leads, and it had to be in contiguous leads. So this is not like some tiny amount of elevation in some wayward lead. These were chest pain patients with some pretty good elevation in contiguous lead. So you would, you would be impressed if you saw this. So they looked at all these patients and they said, well, how many of them actually had a diagnosis of an MI once it was all said and done? And how many of them had some other diagnosis? 15% of them were actually having a heart attack. That means 85% of these chest pain patients with elevation on their 12 lead had some other diagnosis. What were they? Well, a little bit of everything. Most common by far was left ventricular hypertrophy, the LVH patients, and then MI actually tied with left bundle branch blocks for second place. So it was six times as likely that they had some other thing than to actually have a STEMI. MI wasn't even like the single most common thing. It's tied for second. Then you have your, your BER, your right bundles, sort of your nonspecific bundle branch blocks, ventricular aneurysms, the occasional pericarditis, and then some others that just don't fit in there. And what's conspicuously missing here is paced rhythms that may be in the unknown category. But the point is, a whole lot of the time, it had nothing to do with any kind of coronary ischemia. So the point is, Finding ST elevation, which has always been the emphasis of teaching the EKG, especially in pre-hospital medicine, that's not that hard. We should certainly be doing it. We should be catching it almost all the time, but that's not the hard part. The hard part is finding it and then saying, all right, what is it? Is it an MI? Is it something else? If it's an MI, we know what to do. If it's something else, we should not freak out about it. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, we're not doing very well at it. <laughs> About half the time, according to one study, we're getting it wrong, meaning we're seeing elevation, we're calling it a STEMI, but it's not. And there are other studies about this, but the numbers tend to show that we overdiagnose a ton of these. Is that bad? Maybe, maybe not. Most of us would agree it's better to over triage. It's better to play it safe and say that more of these patients are STEMIs than to maybe miss some of them that actually are. Have somebody die on you who you could have helped. But it's not a benign error. 
there are downsides. And just a few of those are, it uh, has a negative effect on the overall system. If you're constantly calling false positive STEMIs, then the cath labs that you're calling eventually will say, well, we can't trust EMS here. We're not going to activate for them anymore. We'll wait until they show up. The emergency physician and maybe the cardiology can take a look, and then they'll make the decision. But that means that it's going to take longer to get these patients reperfused. We want systems that trust EMS and that we can, where we can integrate the entire flow of care. Now, if you can't recognize these false positives, it also weakens your ability to recognize the true positives. Because if you don't really know the ST elevation patients who are not having an MI, then you're not that confident when you do think it's an MI. Because you know that there are a lot of these patients who are not really having the big one, but you can't tell. So all you can say is, well, who knows? We'll just bring them in and they'll sort it out. And that's not good either. And then finally, there's just this issue of professional respect. We want to be providers who are doing their job right and really promote the development of systems where we're integrated with the overall course of care. So it's not a good thing to really be constantly messing this up. And it comes up in other situations like trauma systems and so forth. But again, this is one of the one of the times where we can really make a difference and we want to be doing it right. Uh, some, sometimes when we think it's an MI but it's not, what we're missing can also be dangerous. Sometimes it's pretty benign but there are also cases where it could be killing the patient. Maybe your aortic dissections, um, acute hyperkalemia, we're going to talk about these things but it's not always the safe bet to just say well we'll call it a STEMI. Uh, you can give the wrong treatment. That depends on what you have available. In some places, they're given uh, pre-hospital thrombolytics like TPA. But even something like nitro or aspirin can have a negative effect if it's not what's indicated. And uh, you can bring them to the wrong place. The idea that we're always going to bring these patients to a hospital that has PCI capabilities is not always easy. It's uh, it can mean a significant bypass in some cases, add a half an hour maybe to a transport, which makes it tough for families. They're going to a hospital they're not familiar with. They got to drive a long way to visit them. They got to get back somehow. It uh, upsets the local facilities because they're losing money on these patients, and they can actually kick up a significant fuss politically. Um, and it's, it brings these patients away from the hospitals that they know and that know them, so their records are not available, and it's tough to really integrate their care. Uh, this is a, a, something that's not often understood, but the idea that you can just call all these patients STEMIs, and once you get to the ED, they'll sort it out, that's not necessarily true. Sometimes it is. But there are also liability concerns. So there are times when you can activate a cath lab, you'll get into the ED, and the doctor looks at it, and he does not think it's a STEMI. But it's very different for him to cancel the team than it would be for him to just not call them in the first place. Because no one's ever 100% sure. And if he cancels them and it turns out the patient is having a problem and they have a bad outcome, Everyone's going to look at him and say, well, they were already on the way. Why did you say, no, no, everything's all set? So there are times when they'll be reluctant to do that, and that means everything's going to keep going forward, even though maybe nobody but you thinks there's actually a STEMI there. So that means people got to come in. Uh, it costs money. It drains resources from other patients who may need that. Uh, they may end up actually getting, getting cath when they didn't need it, which also has negative effects. And cut. There can be renal damage from the IV dye, there can be vascular side effects from the intervention. And again, these patients may have another medical emergency which they're not getting treated for while they're lying there on the table. And they're having patients who died because maybe their hyperkalemia was not managed while they were basically getting unnecessarily cathed. So things to think about. These are not necessarily benign errors. It's a quote from Larson. The issue of false positive catheterization, laboratory activation, remains significant concern because unnecessary emergency coronary angiography is not without risk to the patient and may impose a burden on limited human and physical catheterization laboratory resources. And I do know of cath labs in some community hospitals that have closed down because they're just not able to make it financially worthwhile anymore. And it's not like that's EMS's fault, but we can play a 
a role in adding to that burden. So, All right, so how do we wade through all of this and find the real stemmies? So the first and biggest trick is good old clinical correlation. As they say, treat the patient, not the monitor. So you've got to look at the patient that you're dealing with and decide what you really are going to believe. If you took an EKG on me right now, you would probably find some pretty strange findings. I kind of got some funny LVH elevation, maybe some flip T waves, but I hope that no one would rush me off to the hospital to be emergently cast. You got to figure out what you're dealing with here. Uh, and part of that is obviously looking at risk factors. Is this the kind of patient that you would expect to find an MI? Uh, Obviously the smokers, those diabetics, someone with hypertension. Uh, aspirin use is often considered a risk factor, not because aspirin causes heart attacks, but because people at high risk are told to take aspirin, so it's kind of a roundabout look into their healthcare process. But, you know, figure out what you're dealing with, and you know that some people are at much higher risk. Now, old EKGs are a great, great tool that we don't use that much in the field. You see them using this more in the hospital, especially now when they have computerized systems. They can click a couple times and call up a, a patient who's known to them. They can get their old 12 lead from when they were here six months ago. And then it can be really easy to see what changes are new since then. Now, maybe they've developed a left bundle branch block three months ago, and that's going to confound it. But if the only differences between now and then are maybe some increased elevation, then it's much easier to say, ah, oh, okay, I think this is an ischemic change rather than some kind of baseline electrical or structural abnormality. So sometimes you can get your hands on these in the field. If you're going to maybe a, a facility like a nursing home, they may have this in the chart. Some enterprising patients even keep them around at home if they're smart, because then they can just give them to you and you can say, all right, this is new, that's not new. Uh, but it's good to know, especially maybe your frequent flyers. You may know that so-and-so has certain abnormalities. Now, if you can't get the old EKG, your next best bet is just to do serial uh, 12 leads. And this is something that you should be doing probably on just about every patient if you have time. Uh, there's no easier and more commonly available way to help uh, differentiate the tough ones. If I give you a single 12 lead, we can probably argue a lot about what's on it. But if I take one every five minutes and we get six of them, then it's much harder to argue because we can see it changing. And one of the important points here is that ACS, meaning acute coronary syndromes, meaning your STEMIs and all the lesser grades such as n STEMIs and so forth, these are, these are dynamic processes. And most of the things that look like STEMIs but aren't are not something like a left bundle branch block, that's usually pretty stable. So it shouldn't be changing acutely over five or 10 minutes. It certainly shouldn't look like it's worsening. It's there, it's gonna stay that way. But on a blockage in one of your coronary arteries, that's this process that's going back and forth between how much the heart is demanding oxygen and how much it's getting. That's why these patients who should present with a kind of fluctuating, getting better, getting worse kind of pain, not so much starts suddenly and is very bad or suddenly stops and starts, but uh, past few hours, past day, it's kind of, I've kind of had this nasty chest pain that's been getting better and worse. It gets a lot worse when I exert myself. Maybe it improves when I take my nitro. That's the sort of thing that should make you think it's an ischemic change. And when you take these serial 12 leads, you can help appreciate that. You can see it getting worse, or you can see it getting better as you treat. So always try and get your initial one before anything is done. You got that chest pain patient, walk in the room, do your initial assessment, get that 12 lead. Then you can get another one a little later, especially after you're given oxygen, nitro, aspirin, and then you can see maybe it's improved, or maybe 10 minutes from now it's continuing to get worse, and that makes a real difference. There are a lot of smaller EKG findings that can help reinforce these diagnoses, and that's going to be something we talk about quite a bit later. If you're not sure, ask somebody. Some areas we can transmit these to a, a medical control physician. You can get their opinion. Not that they're necessarily any more certain than you are, but it's always good to get another set of eyes on it. If you're working with another medic, maybe a supervisor, they can give good insight.
everyone has a different look at things and that's helpful. Now when that's not possible, and even when it is, the computer algorithm can provide sort of a virtual second set of eyes here. And it's common to really downplay the computer interpretations and certainly we should not be relying on them. But if you know how to use it, they can actually be really valuable and we're going to talk about how to use them. With all of that said, we know that there is no clinical sign or symptom, there is nothing on the EKG, there is no element of history that is totally reliable. There is nothing we can look at that will tell us whether the patient is having an MI or not. So how do we deal with it? You gotta look at everything. And this is always true in medicine, it's certainly true with 12 leads. There's no one thing that'll answer the question, you gotta collect all the data and look at the pattern. And then eventually, if you know what you're doing, hopefully you have a decent degree of certainty what you're dealing with. But if you only have two or three things to look at, you're never going to get there. And that's why we're getting into all of these different types of analysis. You need it all. All right. So using those computer interpretations. Are they perfect? Absolutely not. But they are useful. You really using them, you got to know in what way is they're useful. Now, the majority of pre-hospital monitors out there, what you probably have on your ambulance, use a certain algorithm. It's called the GE Marquette algorithm from GE, which also makes uh, is owns Physio, which makes the LifePak monitors. But they developed this algorithm, the Marquette 12SL, meaning 12 synchronized leads. It's been around for a couple decades. They keep upgrading it, but it's used in pretty much all the life packs out there all the Zoles except the most recent not the Philips MRX Philips has their own algorithm um, so but it's quite widespread and this is becoming a little bit less true because Zoll has recently purchased uh, a third-party algorithm called Innovise it's on their newest X series monitors unfortunately because it's so new we don't have great data yet on how useful it is hopefully more studies will come out. The Marquette algorithm, however, is very well studied because it's not new at all. So, we've all seen some pretty funny interpretations from this. That's fine. All we're going to look at is what does it mean when Marquette says star 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 acute MI suspected star star star. And we've all seen that. What should you do with that? Well, the Marquette algorithm, when it gives you that warning, is very, very specific. Meaning, if it says acute MI suspected, it's probably right. There have been a few studies on this. This one I cited said it's almost 100% specific, meaning it was almost never wrong. Now, it was only about 60% sensitive, meaning it missed a lot of them. There were a lot of STEMIs that it didn't catch. But the point is, it's real specific, and it's fairly sensitive. But what does that mean? It means it's really good for what we're trying to do here, which is to get rid of some of these false positives. So if you see elevation, you think maybe it's a STEMI, take a look at the, the algorithm. If it says acute MI suspected, that's pretty good. That's a pretty good confirmation that it is in fact an MI. Now if you think it's a STEMI and the algorithm doesn't say anything about it, that shouldn't mean much to you, because again, it's not too sensitive. But as far as specificity, it's actually quite good. Now there's a few caveats for that. The Marquette algorithm is very dependent on the quality of the data. So if you're bouncing down the road, the, you have a very wavery baseline with a lot of artifact, who knows what it's going to spit out at you. You really need to get a clean tracing here, and that's important for a number of things. Uh, you need to have ele your electrodes in the right place. Preferably that means on the limbs, not the torso. And I realize that sort of goes against what I just said about limiting artifact. So if possible, you know, get a nice clean tracing when you're, nobody's moving before you start messing around with anything. And if possible, get it on the limbs. There is at least one 12 lead I've seen where there was a pretty clear STEMI with electrodes on the limbs, which was not at all noticeable when it was on the torso. It, uh, the farther apart the electrodes are, the more it exaggerates these differences. So something to think about. In some cases, uh, Zoll monitors may give you a warning when data quality is poor, 
but you shouldn't need that. You should be able to look at it and say, this is a mess, we're going to take a new one, both for the computer and for you. Uh, the Marquette can be fooled by really any tachycardia, but especially actual SVTs. And that's because if they're very fast, everything blurs together, and sometimes it gets confused about what's what. But also because in SVTs, you often have some PR depression. And uh, the Marquette tends to use the PR interval to measure ST elevation. So PR depression can make it think that there is ST elevation. So for both those reasons, if you have a rapid rhythm, especially in SVT, you should be pretty skeptical of the Marquette algorithm. But good data quality, no tachycardia, pretty reliable as far as specificity. Just a few tips for maximizing the data quality, which again is, is important for a number of reasons. Uh, again, when possible, make sure the electrodes go actually on the, on the limbs. As far as the precordial electrodes, try and get them in the right intercostal spaces. I know we all tend to eyeball, and that can be okay, but we also tend to eyeball poorly. And especially when maybe they get to the hospital and they replace everything, and maybe they do it differently than you did, it can make it look like there are changes when in fact there aren't. Uh, if you have a patient who's cold and they're shivering, try to minimize that, keep them warm, get a blanket on them. Shivering can give you a lot of artifact. If you're bouncing around on a bad road and you just can't get a clean tracing, I mean, park the truck if you need to. Turn it off if you need to. Uh, keep the patient from moving. If they are just so diaphoretic you cannot get anything to stick, you need to deal with that. I mean, if they're very hairy, you can consider shaving them. Some places do that, some don't. At the very least, try and dry them off. Um, you can try preparing the skin to keep it dry. It's whatever you need to do. When possible, actually undress them from the waist up. A lot of us are in the habit of just sticking electrodes in holes where we can, but it doesn't end up being a really clean, high-quality tracing the majority of the time. So just start off on the right foot, and you tend to end up with a better result. And just generally stay organized. Don't let things get tangled up. Don't be sort of trying to stick something in from over here and then doing this and getting tangled here. Just keep things on an even keel, approach it the right way, and make it a priority to get good quality. Now, we're really talking about the elevation that's not a STEMI, but to get a good sense of that, you need to have a strong idea for what a STEMI should be. So there are different definitions out there. The one that I recommend is this. You need significant ST elevation in contiguous leads with reciprocal changes in the setting of appropriate clinical correlation. So when I say significant, I mean significant relative to the size of the QRS. Now if it's a very small QRS, that can mean a very small amount of ST elevation is significant. If you have a very large QRS, then maybe a little bit more, and we're going to talk a whole lot about that later. But contiguous, you know what that means. It means you got to know which leads correspond to which regions of the heart and hence to which coronary arteries. So you can understand which, uh, which leads sort of go together anatomically. You see elevation here, here, and here. You say, oh, that makes sense because they're looking at the same place. If you see elevation in sort of random places, it's less likely that they're giving you a real view of one of the arteries. This is uh, regarding the proportionality issue. It's an image from EMS 12 lead, which is just a fantastic educational site. But if you look at this initial tracing in uh, uh, the top here, you'll see maybe there's a tiny bit of elevation, but God, geez, like less than a millimeter almost. But if you blow it up, you can get a sense for the scale. And you see, the QRS here is so small. In reality, the, the ST elevation is a pretty significant portion of it. Maybe it's a, a quarter of the height of that R wave. And that's significant. Now, if it were a much larger QRS, it would not be. But when you look at the scale like this, you say, gosh, that's pretty big. And the, the a T wave, I mean, that's, that's taller than the R wave. So that's what I mean by proportional. Now reciprocal changes, we know what those are, and those are really just one of the best tools that you have. They're not hard to recognize, and they're one of the best ways for increasing specificity. If that study we looked at, that was looking at those chest pain patients with the elevation, 
if they had included re re reciprocal changes, we probably would have seen much better numbers on the number of MIs. Now sometimes these can be subtle, so you gotta keep, it, keep your eyes open, but this should just be a basic part of looking for elevation. And there's a couple studies here that uh, talk about how good it is, but over 90% specificity in some cases. And reciprocal changes can also be the only indication you have of posterior wall MIs. Of course, ordinarily we're not putting posterior uh, chest leads on, but if there is an isolated posterior MI, probably the only time we'll see it is through reciprocal changes in the anterior precordial leads. So if you see maybe depression in V2, V3, have a high suspicion when you can consider some posterior uh, leads. Sort of a, a zen cone here. There's a, one study that showed that something like 80% of patients who came into a certain emergency department had respiratory rates of 16 a minute. It's, my god, it's like a medical miracle. What are the odds of that? And of course, the reason is because nobody was actually counting the respiratory rate. They were just guessing. So in the same sense, if we're not looking for these posterior MIs, we're not going to find them. And a lot of them end up misdiagnosed as anstemias because all we see is the anterior depression, or they're missed entirely. The vast majority of STEMIs are diagnosed as occlusions of the LAD or perhaps somewhat less the right coronary artery. And then very few of them are in the circumflex. And does that mean that there are fewer circumflex occlusions out there? Well, maybe, but probably the majority of that difference is because we're not catching these. Most of those circumflex occlusions are posterior wall, and these are slipping by us. So don't let that happen. Keep your eyeballs out there. Now when I say clinical correlation, you sort of know what I mean by that, but I want to emphasize keeping a, keeping a large net out. Because, yeah, you can have the really classical presentation, that crushing, radiating chest pain, shortness of breath, pale, cool, diaphoretic, nausea, vomiting, etc. But a lot of patients are not going to look like that. And depending on what study you look at, the numbers are different. I cited a couple here which are pretty good, and they suggest maybe a quarter to a third of patients who are having their MIs, they present with atypical or even no symptomatic complaints. So maybe they're having um, it's a little bit of pain somewhere, some discomfort, something you really wouldn't expect, just some weakness, a feeling of illness, anything from dandruff to microdechia, which is of course not playing with a full deck. So keep, keep an open mind. The traditional triad of patients who may present atypically are old people, diabetics, and females. Just for various reasons, diabetics have generally a lot of neuropathy and uh, poor sensation all over, so they may not really be feeling these things. The elderly have all sorts of issues, and females, that's not entirely understood, but there may be some uh, hormonal issues or even cultural ones. So certainly in those type of patients, but really in anyone, keep your eye out. And Again, those elderly diabetic female patients, they also have worse prognosis, so you want to catch them when you can. All right, little clues. And this one is actually really simple and really useful. When you see ST elevation, take a look at the morphology of the ST segment in the T wave. What you really want to see is a concave upstroke, meaning starting at your J point, it should scoop upwards. If you draw a line between the peak of the wave and the J point, you should see space in that in that scoop. It should hold water. That's normal. Nice, benign, physiological T waves and ST segments should look like that most of the time. So your your benign early, early polarizations, that type of thing, that's usually how it's going to look. So that's good. This is a nice, happy ST segment. When you have a unhappy ischemic pathological T wave, it often looks like this. It's convex. So instead of staying under this diagonal line, it's curving above it. And when you start to look for this, you're going to see it really easily because this will not look normal to you. And this is actually a pretty darn good sign. And uh, this one study by Brady is considered 97% specific. So almost always when you saw a convex segment like this, it meant that there was some kind of ischemic cause. 
and about 77% sensitive. So if you don't have it, maybe they're still an MI, but pretty darn good. And they should definitely help reinforce what you're thinking. So as far as serial EKGs, we talked about this. Really, in, in a true MI, you would expect it to be dynamic. It should be changing on you, especially with treatment. Uh, whereas most of these other mimics tend to be much more stable. One important point here is that no matter what's going to go on at the hospital, they will never have a chance to take these early EKGs, meaning as soon as you reach the patient's side throughout your initial treatment and the initial transport. I mean, if you don't record these and print them out, no one's ever going to have them, and that may show things that won't be seen later. It's not uncommon for these occlusions to reperfuse. There's an initial blockage, it goes away. By the time they get to the hospital, everything's fine. Maybe their pain is resolved, they take a 12 lead, it looks fine. Everyone says, hey, this patient's no problem, they can go home. But if you can pull out that 12 lead that shows just a clear STEMI from earlier on, they're gonna say, okay, it was real, it went away, but that doesn't mean that they're not at risk. So that's important. You can also help show that evolution. If the first strip that they have at the hospital is the one that they take, they may have to wait for a while until they can really appreciate the changes that are happening. Unless you can show them, here's the one when we got on scene, here's one from when we got unloaded up, here's one from when we were transporting. You can see it's getting worse. The elevation's increasing. The reciprocal changes are increasing. You'll see the patient has gotten worse. This is for real. So that's really significant. So again, when you can get a previous EKG from the patient's baseline, that is fantastic. But again, you gotta remember, it doesn't mean that the changes you're seeing are new. It just means they're new since they had that last EKG. So it could be from a year ago. Who knows what's happened in the past year? They could have had a heart attack six months ago, and you're seeing maybe Q waves from that. Maybe they developed a bundle branch block or LVH or something. So keep in mind, it doesn't mean that it's part of the acute situation, but it's still very, very useful. All right, scarbosis criteria. This is one of my favorite tools. It will become one of yours too. And there are different ways of talking about it. The specific criteria we call scarbosis. You can call it generally maybe the rule of appropriate discordance, but it's a general concept which applies a whole lot. So originally, Elena Scarbosa came up with this in 1996. This was a system for diagnosing MI in the setting of a left bundle branch block. And we're going to talk more about left bundles later. But the general idea is the predominant wave in the QRS, and I like to think of it as the final wave, which sometimes makes a difference, should be deflected opposite from the ST segment in the T wave. Meaning, if the last thing you see in your QRS is positive, meaning an R wave, then the, what you see in your ST segment should be maybe negative shift, so ST depression, and T wave inversion. If the last thing you see in your QRS is negative, meaning an S wave, you should see a nice positively shifted ST segment, so elevation, and an upright T wave and those changes should be proportional to the size of the QRS. And I know that makes no sense, but we're gonna look at it. Here's what we're talking about. Here's your QRS, nice and positive, right? This would be maybe for a, uh, a right bundle branch block. Now look at our ST segment, it's depressed. It is moved opposite from the QRS. QRS is positive, ST segment is shifted negatively. It's down, it's depressed and the T wave is also inverted, so it's shifted away from the QRS. This is discordant, and it's about proportional. It's not too huge, it's not too small compared to the QRS. Now look at this, maybe for a left bundle. The QRS is predominantly negative, so what do we see? The ST segment is positive, it's shifted upwards, there's elevation, and the T wave is positive, it's shifted up discordantly from the QRS. So this is normal. This is what we want to see in a bundle branch block and a number of other cases too. If we don't see this, that's when we start to worry there may be an ischemic cause on top of that. 
So this is an example of what we're talking about is a pretty normal discordance. This is a left bundle. It's actually a little bit strange because it's quite wide, but the discordance is very normal. This is just the precordial leads, but look at this. So look at maybe V4. This is your nice deep, uh, so be maybe an S wave. So what is it, maybe f about four large boxes. You have some ST elevation, right? A couple small boxes. So not very much, and it's opposite from the QRS. So it's a discordant, and it's more or less proportional. There's not a whole lot of it. And the T wave is positive, so it's a discordant. And you see this in every lead. And you see when the QRS is even larger, such as in V2, there's a little bit more ST elevation. So that's all very, very normal. This is a nice, normalish left bundle branch block. Again, except maybe for the fact that it's on the wide side. So this was originally developed for left bundles. Now, in practice, what we find is that it works for right bundle branch blocks. For LVH, it works quite well. Paste ventricular rhythms, non-paste ventricular rhythms, so an idioventricular ventricular rhythm, even PVCs should follow this pattern. And to some extent, WPW and other forms of pre-excitation. So very, very useful as just a general concept when we're trying to sort these causes of elevation out. Now, the exact criteria that Scarbosa validated in the setting of chest pain and when there's a left bundle branch block, if there's concordant elevation, which is more than a millimeter in any lead that has a positive QRS, so that's like saying concordant elevation, which should not be appropriate, or depression in V1, V2, V3, meaning leads that should be negative in the left bundle. So again, we're talking about concordant depression or discordant elevation when there's a negative QRS, which is more than five milliliters. And what that's saying is too much discordance. So it's not concordant, that's good. It's in the same, it's in the opposite direction from the QRS, but it's too much. It's not proportional. And the actual study showed that when you look at these criteria and you sum them up, if uh, they were worth different amounts of points, and if you got more than three, it was over 98% specific, but not very sensitive. More than two points, it was a little bit less specific, but more sensitive. I am not trying to say that you should be using these criteria with calipers and measuring out the points, but the concepts are very, very useful. This is an illustration of the three rules. Here you have concordance, you have a positive QRS, positive ST segment shift, and a positive T wave, so that's inappropriate. Here you have uh, a negative concordance, you have the negative QRS, you have a negative ST shift, and uh, in this case the T wave is appropriately discordant. And then this is the third one where it's discordant, you have a negative QRS, and a positive ST segment shift, but it's too much. It's, in this case, it's over five millimeters. So those are the three Scarbosa criteria. Now that third rule, the, where you have too much discordance, that's the trickiest one. And it, what it was found was to have the least specificity. And a lot of the problems that we find come up when the QRS is very large. And the reality is that what we really have is a scale. When there's a very large QRS, the ST segment can move quite a bit, and that may be normal. So what we really want is not a specific number, like five millimeters, but some kind of proportional rule. And what was done by Dr. Stephen Smith over in Hennepin was exactly that. And he came up with, if you have a discordant ST elevation of more than about a fifth of the depth of that terminal S wave, that's too much. And he has played around with this rule. He's gone back and forth from a, a fifth to a, a fourth and uh, moved around the specificity and sensitivity of it. But in general, if you apply that concept, it seems to work very, very well. It reduces the false positives we have when there is a very large QRS, such as an LVH. 
and it actually reduces the false negatives, so it helps us catch more of those STEMIs when there is a small QRS, micro voltages like we talked about. Because even if there's a, a small QRS, even a small amount of ST elevation may be too much if it's more than about a quarter or a fifth of the, uh, the amplitude there. So this actually works quite well. So this is an example of appropriate changes. This is a left bundle branch block. Look at maybe V2 here. Nice deep uh, S, uh, maybe an S wave. So maybe about four large blocks, couple small blocks of elevation. That's just fine. Uh, look at maybe V5 here. You got a positive QRS and then maybe one or two millimeters of depression and then negative T wave. That's great. So you see how everything is really shifted opposite from the QRS. And when you look at a lot of these, you'll get in the habit of looking for that pattern, that kind of a strain pattern, down, up, up, down. And that's normal, and that's what we want to see. Now look at this on the other hand. This doesn't look the same at all, does it? Look at V2 here. We have a nice negative deflection, as we expect. And then we have ST depression not elevation. Where is that discordance? It should be elevated, shouldn't it? Instead it's depressed and there's a negative T wave. That's not okay. That's concordance. Look at V5. We have a positive QRS and then instead of appropriate negative discordance, deflection, we have elevation. A couple millimeters of ST elevation there and then a positive T wave. And then even more in V6. That's not okay. Look at lead three. Here it's appropriately uh, opposite, right? We have a nice and negative QRS and then ST elevation, but look how much. It's almost as much ST elevation as the negative depth of that uh, S wave. That's not, a, that's not less than a fifth. That's like almost a one-to-one -one ratio. That's way too much. You see what I'm saying? These are no longer the kind of changes that we want to see out of the nice normal left bundle branch block. In fact, what's going on here is a STEMI on top of a left bundle branch block. It's an inferior posterior STEMI. There's a, a left circumflex occlusion as well as an RCA occlusion. In fact, this is a nice example of uh, reciprocal changes for the posterior portion. These are uh, depression and a T wave inversion. And if we put posterior leads on, we would see elevation there. And then you see the elevation in the, uh, in the inferior leads here. These inappropriate uh, amounts of discordance. So this may seem pretty subtle, but after a while, this type of 12 lead should jump out at you as being really inappropriate. So the point of all of that is just use these general principles. Don't sweat the exact numbers. I don't think anybody is going to memorize the specifics of the original Scarbosa rule or any similar rule, but the idea of appropriate amounts of discordance, that's very, very useful, and it's not difficult to do. You can get in the habit of recognizing it from across the room on a 12 lead. 